I don't know if you've ever heard the story before of a guy who gets to heaven and once he gets to heaven, he's overwhelmed. He's overwhelmed by the streets of gold. He's overwhelmed by the pearly gates. He's overwhelmed by the crystal sea and uh, an angel's kind of giving him a tour of heaven. He's just gotten there and uh, the angel shows him this big warehouse. And it had been the biggest warehouse he had ever seen. I mean, it goes on and on for miles. It, it probably has millions and millions of uh, square feet. And the angel tells him to go on in. And he, so he opens the door and he enters this warehouse and it's just full of presents. I mean, there is just row after row and shelf after shelf of present after present. And as he walks a little bit, he notices that all of the presents, they're beautifully wrapped. They have a beautiful bow on them. And then they all have a name tag. And then he looks at the name tag and he notices that on every name tag, where it says to, it has his name. And then it says from God. And he looks at the angel and he says, what is this? What are all these presents? And the angel says to him, these are all the blessings you could have had from God, but you never ask. Or if you ask, you didn't trust God and obey God so he could grant them to you. You see, God's a giver. And as our heavenly father, he wants to bless his children, but there's a catch. And the catch is, we must ask, and then we must trust and obey him. And so often when it comes to our subject today, we don't want to do that. And so often when it comes to our subject today, we just want to trust man's wisdom, or we just want to do what we think is best, or what maybe feels right, or what others have taught us. I want to give you an amazing thought today. God has a warehouse of presence with your name on it. And he, as a good father, wants to bless you. He is an extravagant God. Now, if you've attended Fincastle Baptist for any length of time, hopefully you know a couple of things. Hopefully you know, number one, that I love you. And hopefully you know, number two, that I want something for you rather than something from you. And I believe that you are here today. I believe that you are in church today because you want to hear from Almighty God. I believe that you are in church today because you want to know God. And if you know him, you want to grow in your relationship with God so you can live out your faith, not just on a Sunday morning, but you can live out your faith. And hopefully, here's the second thing I believe about you. You want a pastor who will teach you all the Bible, even, even the hard parts. And I'm just going to be real with you today. When it comes to our subject today, I, I'm fearful. I'm fearful of being misunderstood. I'm fearful you won't know my heart. I'm feeling you'll, fearful you'll just kind of roll your eyes and tune me out. I'm kind of fearful that you'll think I'm trying to guilt you or manipulate you. I've talk, called this the series, I don't want to teach, but I really need to. Why do I really need to? Because listen, if I knew the answer to something that would be beneficial to you, if I knew the answer to something that would improve your health, if I knew the answer to something that could reduce your stress and resolve conflict in your marriage and bring you joy and happiness, if I didn't share that with you, wouldn't you be angry at me? See, that's exactly what God's money management plan will do for you. Every time we open this book and every time we learn from the Bible about how to handle worry or stress or every time we study about relationships or dealing with fear or regret, we, we all benefit. We all, we all take the the next step. But even though Jesus spoke on this subject that we're going to cover today, he spoke on finances and stewardship more than he did heaven and hell and prayer combined. There's just something inside of us, especially as Americans, that, that, that when preachers try to deal with this subject, there's just something inside of us that just kind of pushes back. And we react negatively, and I get it. I understand. I mean, money is so powerful. It, 
It's so personal. It really reveals what our priorities are, but we all deal with it. We all handle it. We all spend a lot of time trying to earn it, spend it wisely, and God wants to bless us, and God wants to help us get it right. And so if you haven't already done so, open your Bible to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and we'll start reading in verse nine. Luke 16. Now, if you don't have a hard copy of the word of God, we've got free Wi-Fi at both our campuses. Those of you up in Allegheny County and our Highlands campus that are watching today, there's free Wi-Fi up there. You go ahead and open up to Luke chapter 16. And here Jesus is telling a story. It's called a parable. A matter of fact, do you know that two thirds of Jesus' parables are about this subject? Two thirds of Jesus' parables are about this subject. And look what he says in Luke chapter 16 and verse nine. I tell you, Jesus speaking, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little also can be trusted with much. And whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No servant can serve two masters. Either he'll hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and and money. What is Jesus teaching here? He's teaching on your handout. Number one, we must understand God's purpose for wealth. Now, we all know that wealth is measured in much more than just Federal Reserve notes, okay? But this parable and our lesson today is specifically about money. And Jesus says in verse nine, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves. So when it's gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Now, this verse is very confusing. Let me help you. Here's what he's not teaching. He's not teaching by your way into heaven. He's not teaching that you pay for your salvation. No, over and over again, the scriptures remind us that salvation is a free gift. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, A, on your handout, money is a test. We studied this last week in Matthew 6, that as we go through life, there will be four financial tests we will all face. It doesn't matter our gender. It doesn't matter our background. It doesn't matter our current economic status. As we go through life, we will all face four financial tests. Malachi 3 says God wants to bless you. He wants to throw open the windows of heaven and pour out so much blessing, but we must follow God's money management plan. You see, most Christians don't understand the principle Jesus is teaching. They don't realize how money affects our spiritual development. But Jesus says very clearly, verse 11, if you've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? You see, B, how I handle money determines how much God will bless me. Now, hold on a second, Pastor Kevin. You're starting to sound like some of those TV preachers. You start to sound like one of those prosperity, health, and wealth guys. Jesus is not teaching that God wants everybody to be a millionaire. That's not what he's saying here. No, he's talking about, look at it again, true riches. You see, God's not some genie in a bottle. He's not just a jackpot. You know, you put in a buck, pull the lever, and get 100,000. No, many saints in the Old Testament were poor. There were also many of them that were wealthy. See, the problem is today in our culture, uh, these crooked, unbiblical preachers have called us to be so cynical that we miss that there is a direct relationship in the Bible between what I do with my money and spiritual depth in my life. Matter of fact, Jesus would say, see, the greatest use of money is to use it 
in getting people to heaven. Matthew 8, uh, Mark 8, what good is it to gain the whole world and lose your own soul? Last week we talked about Kanye West and how he had everything, but he came to the point that he realized he had nothing. And verse 9 talks about being welcomed into eternal dwellings. What's he saying? He's saying heaven should be full of people who cheer when you get there. Heaven should be full of people that when you get there, they say, look who's here. Not, wow, look who's here. I mean, heaven should be full of people that go, I can't believe it. He's finally here. Can you imagine being in heaven for five minutes and somebody comes up to you and says, hey, it's because of you. It's because of you. You played a part in me getting here. And you go, wait, wait a second. I never met you. We never met one another while on earth. Who are you anyway? What do you mean I played a part in you getting here? They say, oh, yeah, yeah, we never met. But because you tied to that church, they were able to put on a ladies' conference where I heard the truth of the gospel and who I am in Christ and it radically transformed my life forever. Or can you imagine somebody coming up to you and saying, because you tied... That church was able to support a mission team that went to Uganda, Africa, in the darkest, deep corners of Africa, and they told me the truth of Jesus, and I heard about this man named Jesus, and I received him into my heart, my life, and I'm in heaven today, part because of your faithfulness, or you sponsored a harvest fest, and my kids loved it, and they begged me about going to church there, and I didn't really want to go, but then I went, and I learned that it really wasn't that bad after all, and then I kept going for weeks and weeks, and then I heard the preacher preach the gospel, and now I've asked Christ in my heart all those years ago, and now I'm in heaven because of what you did. It's an eternal IRA. You see, I can't witness to everybody. I can't share Christ with everybody, but I can have a part in making sure that everybody has an opportunity to go to heaven. I've got to understand God's purpose. And then number two, Jesus says, we must understand God's pattern for living. Now, Jesus doesn't back down here. Jesus just kind of lays it out. Very plainly, he says in verse 10, look at it. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. What's he saying? Hey, God expects me to be responsible with money. How I earn it, how I spend it, my attitude. Now, again, we gotta be careful here because, I mean, this unbiblical health and wealth gospel, so many preachers take this verse out of context. He is not saying that everybody that's a Christian will be healthy and wealthy. No, he's saying if I am faithful with what I have, God will trust me with more of it. If I'm faithful in the little things, I'll be faithful in the big things. We see this in every area of life, right? If I'm faithful at work, my likelihood to get a promotion is greater. What's he saying? Faithfulness in little things is what counts. He's saying little things matter. Uh, So last month, Terry and I took our annual trip to Pigeon Forge. Every year, we go to Pigeon Forge in October. We normally rent a cabin, and uh, she loves it. And we go there, and there's, there's, there's these things in Pigeon Forge that she likes a lot more than I do, outlet stores. And so we go to Pigeon Forge, and she gets a jump start. Some would argue finishes our Christmas shopping And we work on Pastor Kevin's patience. So it's a great thing that we're doing this together. And But I have discovered after doing this multiple years and working on my patience at the outlets for multiple years that there's some stores there that that are actually okay. And there's one, matter of fact, that sells... uh, tennis shoes. Now, before you worry, no, I'm not going to be a preacher in sneaker on Instagram, okay? If you know what that means, great. If not, just ignore it. And so some of you got it, especially if you're under 40. And uh, so, but I bought some sneakers there and every year I go to this one store and I just load up. I mean, I buy about three, four pairs of sneakers because I wear them out. So I got my new pairs of sneakers on. I'm happy. I'm back from the outlets and it was a couple of days ago and I'm on the treadmill. And you never know how you get a new pair of sneakers and they just don't fit right, right? You got to break them in, right? You got to break them in. So there I am. I'm on the treadmill and I'm kind of angry because number one, I'm on the treadmill. (laughs) 
and I'm kind of angry because I'm running and nobody's chasing me, okay? But anyway, so there I am and I'm on the treadmill and it just don't feel right, but I'm gonna power through, you know? So I do my couple miles and man, I do this workout and I'm on the treadmill in the basement and then, you know, I go to take off my sneakers and there was a little rock inside my shoe. Little things matter. You know, Jesus talked a lot about this, didn't he? He talked about a splinter in our eye. He said something about having faith as small as a mustard seed. You ask any athlete, you ask any musician, you ask any salesman, faithfulness in the little things is what counts. Consistency, day in, day out, day in, day out, doing the right thing. So when it comes to much, when it comes to verse 11, worldly wealth, what Jesus is reminding us here, be inconsistent giving produces inconsistent living. Maybe the reason your spiritual life is stuck, maybe the reason you feel like you're always struggling is inconsistency. See, if you show me someone who is consistent in following God's money management plan. I'll show you someone who has less stress, who has more peace, that has a lot of growth because they are following God's pattern for living. And then Jesus says, number three, we must understand God's principles for blessing. God wants to bless us, but there's some principles. Look what he says, verse 11. You've not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth. Who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? What are some of the principles we see through the Bible? A, there's the principle of ownership. Time and time again, the Bible reminds us that I don't really own anything. I'm just a steward. I'm just a manager. Psalm has said it this way, Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Ecclesiastes 5 talks about God giving me wealth and resources. I get to use it for 60, 70, 80, 90, maybe 100 years, and then what I do, I pass it on to somebody else. Everything I have comes from God. Now hold your finger here in Luke 16 and turn to 1 Chronicles chapter 29. Let's be honest, we don't read much from Chronicles. Let me give you a second to find it. First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 10. David praises the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly and he says, praise be to you, O Lord, God of our father Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, O God, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? There's the principle of ownership. B, there's the principle of tithing. Uh, Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of your increase. The Bible says right from the beginning, I'll take care of you, but I want you to put me first. Over and over again in the Bible, we see first things first. God says, 10% of all you make, I want you to return back to me. Now, why did God say 10%? I have no idea. He could have said 5%. He could have said 20%. He could have said 50%. God doesn't want my money. He wants what it represents, my heart. We studied last week, my heart follows where my treasure is. And when it comes to this idea of tithing, I was talking to a couple of our staff guys this week and a couple of them just said, Press Kevin, I just don't think people understand. I don't think they either really have ever, never been taught so they don't understand. So just let me help you very basically. Number one, what is a tithe? It's 10% of my income. And now what's that mean? Throwing a 20 in the offering plate is not tithing unless I earn $200 a week. Let me use another illustration. Putting a $100 bill in the offering plate every Sunday is not tithing 
unless my combined household income is $52,000 a year. Why should I do it? Why should I tithe? Well, there's several reasons. Look at your hand up. Number one, because God commands it. Oh, way back in Leviticus 27, he says, the tenth of all you produce is the Lord's, it's holy. Matthew 23, Jesus said, you should tithe. On your handout, tithing proves God has first place in my life. Look at the verse on your handout. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your lives. On the back side, look, tithing reminds me everything was given to me by God. Deuteronomy 8, the Lord your God gives you the ability to produce wealth. Tithing allows me to express my gratitude to God. Psalm 116, how can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? Deuteronomy 16, I'm to bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord has blessed me. Matter of fact, refusing to tithe, Malachi 3 says, is stealing from God. Will a man rob God? You go, no way, God, I wouldn't rob you. But God says, yes, some of you are robbing me. Well, God, how are we doing that? He says in Malachi 3, 8, in tithes and offerings. Tithing gives God a chance to bless you. That's what we're talking about here. Proverbs 22, a generous man will be blessed. Tithing proves I really love God. Jesus says, if you love me, obey me. And tithing makes a difference. Hold your finger here and turn to 2 Corinthians 9. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 6. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he scattered abroad his gifts to the poor and his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You'll be made rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result and thanksgiving to God. This service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God because of the service by which you've proved yourselves. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Jesus and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. What's he saying? Your tithing makes a difference in other people's lives and it makes a difference in your life. Now, I am not trying to guilt you or manipulate you. Can, by the way, can I just remind you, I have no idea who gives what here. Me and the other pastors have no idea who gives what. We keep ourselves from that information. I never want to be tempted to treat you differently. We put it in the bulletin every week. I mean, come on, I jokingly say it's the only part of the bulletin that everybody reads. You come in here, we all do it. We look at how many people were here last week and we look at the tithes and offerings. But giving to this ministry makes a difference. It also makes a difference in your life. Well, number three, where should I tithe? Well, the Bible tells me, Malachi 3, the storehouse, the temple, the church, where I worship. I don't tithe to the building fund. I don't tithe to missionaries. I don't tithe to charity. Well, when should I do this? 1 Corinthians 16, Sunday on the first day of the week. Well, how should I do it? We just read it. I should give generously, willingly, cheerfully, expectantly, not out of guilt, not under compulsion. Well, what's the difference between a tithe and an offering? On your handout, an offering is anything I give above my tithe. I'm all for missions. I'm all for the building fund and giving to charity. I'm all for church planning, but that is gifts above my tithe. Well, what's the key to all this? On your handout, they gave themselves first to the Lord. You ever done that? I mean, it's such a tough subject for pastors. So many, they put such an overemphasis on this. In some churches, it's all you hear about, sermon after sermon. And, and if you're here today, or if you're a guest, man, you can be cynical at this point. Can I just be real with you? I, I have not done a complete series on this subject since 2011. And God really convicted me about that. 
because I want to help you. And I don't want something from you. I want something for you. And if I knew what could reduce stress, reduce arguments in your marriage, bring you joy and peace, but, but I'm just fearful. I, so many of you walk in here with hurts and struggles and hard times, and, and I'm much more comfortable teaching how to handle life's hurts or how to overcome or with God's help, you'll get through this. I, I'm much more comfortable teaching about relationships and marriage and parenting. And I'm so fearful. And I, can I just be really share with you what God did for me this week? Just for me. So I was just struggling with it. Because God, you know, and now we have this ladies conference and people come and give yourselves first to the Lord. So I had two people in my office this week. Two people in my office this week. And they were struggling with stuff. And can I just tell you, this, this doesn't happen week after week for me. And two people in my office, two grown adults, I would say over the age of 40, easy, two people in my office, both, I was able to witness grown adults, see them bow their head and pray and ask Christ to come into my heart and my life. How did I do that? You know, they were struggling and I said, hey, have you ever seen this book? Have you ever seen this book? This is a weird book. What makes this book unusual is what it doesn't have. It doesn't have words. It doesn't have pictures, but it tells the best story ever. I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I read a book, I like to just cut to the chase. So the last page on this book is yellow. And I said to them, you know, when I see yellow, it reminds me of heaven. How the Bible says the streets are paved with pure gold and everybody wants to go to heaven. You know, the Bible says that there's no need for the sun there, that the glory of God, Jesus Christ, illuminates all of heaven. And everybody wants to go to heaven, but there's a problem. And the problem is we've all got some dark places in our life. We've all done wrong. And the Bible has a big fancy word for it. It's called sin. And the Bible says that I've sinned. And I said to them, and you've sinned. And the Bible says that if I've ever committed just one sin, that's enough to keep me out of heaven. Well, most of us blew that a long time ago. But the Bible says the wages of my sin is death in hell, separated from God's love forever. But that's why Jesus came and shed his blood and died on the cross and was buried and rose from the dead. Because the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the Bible says that though my sins be red like scarlet, they can be white as snow. And you can walk out of here today having peace on the inside. The Bible says it's the peace that passes understanding. I said, do you have that? Well, how did I get that peace? How do I get that? I want that. You come to the point where you just say, God, I need you. God, I need you. And God, I realize I've done wrong. I've sinned. Will you forgive me? I believe. I believe Jesus died. He was buried. He rose from the dead for me. And you just say, God, I need you in my life. Come into my heart, my life. Make me a Christian. Have you ever done that? And what a joy it was to see those two adults, tears streaming down their face, praying as Christ in their heart. And then what do I do after that? Well, the Bible says to show everybody what Christ has done for me is why I get baptized. I don't get baptized in order to go to heaven. I get baptized because I already have the assurance that I'm going to heaven. So one day, whenever my time on this earth is up, I can have the assurance. I don't hope so. I don't think so. I'm not pretty sure. The Bible says I should know that I know that I know my eternal destiny. Well, what do I do in the meantime? What do I do while I'm waiting? I grow in my faith. Just like the grass grows and the trees grow and the bushes grow, I'm to grow spiritually. Have you ever first given yourself to the Lord? Has everybody explained it to you that simple? That there is a real place called heaven and God wants everybody to be with him, but there's a problem, there's a catch, and you know it. You and I have done wrong. And you and I know that we've sinned and that's why you need Jesus Christ who died, shed his blood, was buried, but rose from the dead. And you today can walk out of here with the peace that passes the understanding. 
you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you know you're going to heaven. And then once you know that, your first act of obedience is you follow him in baptism and show everybody you've received Christ so that one day, hopefully years from now, you'll walk on the streets of gold. In the meantime, what do you do? The purpose of this church is to help people know God and then once they know him, to grow in God and live for God. You ever done that? You see, there's the principle of ownership. There's the principle of tithing. And then C, we don't talk a lot about it much in church, but there's a principle of saving. Proverbs 21, the wise man saves for the future. The foolish man spends whatever he gets. Uh, Proverbs 6 says, consider the ant. Look at the ant. Even the ant with their small brain saves food for the future. See, the most basic principle for avoiding financial struggle is don't spend more than you make and save for the future. But most Americans, instead of spending only what we make, we hope to make as much as we spend. Jesus is saying, don't live for today. And then there's the principle D of planning because financial freedom is not based on how much I make. It's based on how I spend it. And I can live financially free in this country with almost any income level. But people always say, well, I just don't have enough. I I have trouble paying my bills. I'm in debt up to my neck. See, the lack, can I just say to you, the lack of money is not the problem. The real problem is the difference between my needs and my wants. The real difference is the difference between my needs and my greeds. And if I think the problem is money, I will always spend my life trying to get more of it. But in the long run, it never works. We learned last week the real problem is a problem of my heart. And I'm not following God's money management plan. Financial freedom is not based on how much we make. It's based on how much you spend. So a budget on your handout is a theological document because it shows what's important to you. Proverbs 21, plans lead to profit. Proverbs 27, know the condition of your flocks and herds. In other words, God says, I need to know what I own. I need to know what I own earn. I need to know what I owe. Don't wonder where all your money went at the end of the month. Tell it where to go. That's what a budget is. That's why it's a theological document. And then E, there's the principle of contentment because some things are more important than things. But Ecclesiastes 3 says, enjoy what you have and what you've worked for. It's God's gift. Philippians 4 says, I've learned the secret of being content you got to learn it. It doesn't come naturally, especially in America, and it's a secret. Few people get it. I learned the secret of being content. Hebrews 13 says, keep free from the love of money. Be content with what you've worked for, for God is with you. He's your helper. Do not fear. And then lastly, number four, we must understand God's priority of loving. Look how he ends this little parable, verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot. He doesn't say you better, he doesn't say you better not. He doesn't say it'll be unwise. He doesn't say it'll be difficult. No, he says you cannot serve both God and money. It is impossible. I'm gonna go out on a limb right here and say none of you wanna hate God. I mean, you're in church today. But the way According to this verse, the way most of us live and the fact that we don't follow God's money management plan, the fact we get so worked up, so stressed, so anxious, we devote so much of our time, energy, and effort, so much of our life to earning and saving and spending and worrying about and accumulating it. Jesus is saying, I must choose what I love most in life. He's saying it's a choice. It's kind of like trying to please two bosses. It's kind of like in countries where men marry multiple women. It'd be kind of like trying to please two mother-in-laws. God says, I want first place in your life. Exodus 20, no other gods, but money is a great thing, but it's a lousy God. Money is a great thing, but it's a lousy small g God. Now listen, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Number one, the number one thing God wants from you on your handout is your heart. Have you ever given yourself to the Lord? Have you ever said, God, I need you and I want to go to heaven? God, 
I freely admit I have sinned. God, forgive me. I believe you died, buried, and rose from the dead. I want that eternal peace. I want to know you. Have you ever done that? Maybe you're feeling pressure today about finances. Maybe in your marriage you're always arguing about it. Maybe there's more month than there is money, and it seems like that's a reoccurring thing for you. Maybe you're just spending it all, you're saving nothing, you're wondering where it all goes, and can I remind you, number two, that out-of-control finances are a symptom, a symptom of an out-of-control life. That's why you need Jesus Christ. That's why you've got to follow God's money management plan. God wants to help you. God wants to bless you. And your good God has provided the answers to your struggle in life in his word. Remember his purpose for wealth. Money is a test. And I don't care if you have a lot or if you have a little You and I were tested. Money is a test, God says. Remember God's pattern for living. God wants me to pass the test. So be responsible with money because it's all his money anyway because really I don't own anything. And remember his principles for blessing, his principles of ownership, of tithing, of saving and planning. And don't you dare miss his priority of loving that he loves you. It's what he does. It's who he is. So listen to me, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, listen to me, no matter Where you've been, God's grace is for you today. You first give yourself to the Lord. Have you done that? Do you know? You see, I'm encouraging you to settle it once and for all right now, friend. Now, some of you here under the sound of my voice today, you'd say, well, I did that years ago, pastor. I did that years ago. Great. Then let me ask you a hard question as we close. And it's hard. And it's personal. And it's practical. And it reveals where your priorities are. It doesn't matter what we say. It really reveals it. And it's hard. But listen, if you know Christ, number three, are you honoring God with his money that he's entrusted to you? 